I'm Rob LeCoury, a senior editor at Gold Derby here with sound legend Randy Tom, whose latest work is George Clooney's contemplative and moving sci-fi odyssey, The Midnight Sky. Randy, you've worked on films for decades, on some of the most beloved films of all time. I'd say you're probably one of the most, if not the most prolific sound designers in showbiz. So that begs the question, how did designing the sound for The Midnight Sky present new challenges to you? Oh, I think every movie presents new challenges and uh, George's expectations for this movie were very high. And, uh, you know, one group of challenges was trying to figure out what space was going to sound like, uh, which is always a big question mark. And the, another set of challenges was uh, what this, uh, you know, really severe, uh, terrible Arctic <laughs> uh, earthbound experience was going to sound like. And, you know, we can talk specifically about those. But uh, one of the biggest challenges, it turned out, was uh, a dialogue challenge. Um, as you know, uh, George Clooney plays uh, the older version of the character Augustine in the movie. And Ethan Peck, uh, it was Gregory Peck's grandson, plays the younger version of Augustine. And um, our problem was that um, Ethan's voice sounded different enough from George's voice so that it felt a little odd uh, making that transition uh, from the younger Augustine to the older Augustine because you felt, well, it doesn't really sound like the same person, you know, aged a little bit. Uh, and so essentially we didn't want it to sound completely different from George, that is the young Augustine, but we also didn't want it to sound exactly like George. Uh, and we tried that as well. We actually had George uh, ADR young Augustine's lines, just to see how that would sound. And we process them a bit to try to make him sound younger. Uh, but that also felt wrong, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, because it wasn't <laughs> Ethan's performance. And so the long story short is that we pulled out our usual bag of tricks in terms of the normal kinds of processing, pitch changing the voices, and we brought in sound alikes for George to see if we could get something that was closer to him, uh, but not too close. And that didn't work as well as we wanted. And so we resorted to finally this kind of bleeding edge technology using artificial intelligence. Wow. There's a lot of research been going on in the last few years in terms of digital voice manipulation and you know, human voice synthesis. And it has lots of uses, uh, some of which uh, are a little sinister. Um, it, it's a little scary to think that uh, somebody can perfectly imitate someone else's voice without them knowing it, but uh, we're getting very close to that. And so what we wound up doing was studying uh, using AI, uh, very meticulously, George's voice and Ethan's voice. And then we mapped certain characteristics of George's voice onto Ethan's voice and vice versa. And so the sound that you hear coming out of the young Augustine character's mouth now is quite literally a composite of uh, Ethan Peck's voice and George Clooney's voice. It's incredible because when you watch the film, you watch Ethan's performance and you think, wow, it's so uncanny. Like what great casting, what great performance, but actually, yes, of course they are important, but the sound design is so critical. And it brings me then to this pretty obvious question, borrowing from your excellent essay on this topic. It's a great example of how really compelling sound design influences the other creative elements of the film. And that's been one of your philosophies for many years, obviously, as well. Um, are there any other examples where the sound really played a very pivotal role in how the other elements of the film are going to come together? Well, the, the radio communication um, in, in the film is very important. Um, 
you know, they are, you know, the film is in many ways all about isolation, uh, you know, isolation beyond anybody's control and isolation that should be within somebody's control. The character Augustine has you know, isolated himself from everybody else, uh, you know, throughout his life and that he doesn't realize how big a problem that was until the end. But the this reaching out that they are doing on the spaceship to try to make contact with anybody who's willing to talk with them and their failure to do that uh, is obviously an important element of the story and an important theme. And in sound design, we always look for themes to explore. And so we knew going in that the sound of the radio communication, just the kind of noise and the tones and the tonalities that you hear uh, when uh, when they're attempting to reach somebody via radio were going to be really important. So we we uh, spent a lot of time uh, shaping those radio sounds noises around the score of the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, uh, from very early on, we had uh, Alexandre Desplat's uh, uh, temporary you know, sketches of the music that he was gonna compose. And then obviously in the end, the, the final version of the music. And so it was really a kind of moment by moment adjustment so that uh, the radio noise and the radio signals and the music would feel like one thing uh, instead of stepping on each other's toes. And probably a good example of that is the, uh, the first time that the Sully character uh, tries to use the radio very early in, in the movie and the camera pulls out of the spaceship and into space and then moves in to see the outside of the spaceship as it's moving. And you see various things that look like antennas and we you know, took the poetic license to make certain kinds of radio sounds louder when we get close to those antennas. Yeah. Um, and, and it really worked. And I think it wouldn't have worked as well if we hadn't had that time to uh, do those experiments with uh, coordinating the, the music and the sound design. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I noticed that too. And um... I just love it when sound um, is so immersive, and uh, and and I think Alexander Desplat's score, as you mentioned, um, is a is obviously a part of the soundscape of the film, and it's been widely praised as really raising the bar for scores this year. In fact, it feels like another character to me in the film. I was just wondering because you've worked with so many composers, how important is a really good, effective score to what you're trying to achieve on the whole picture of the sound design? Well, it's uh, ideally it, it should all feel like one thing. Uh, you, somebody who's experiencing the film should just feel kind of washed over by the whole sonic experience and not really think in terms of, okay, the, I'm hearing sound design now and I'm hearing music now and it should be a kind of, you know, holistic experience. And so, yeah, absolutely. The way the music and the sound design work together is absolutely crucial. And uh, that, that, that's why we spend so much time trying to, to make that happen. Yeah. And it's yeah. also, you yeah. know, it's a, it's a little like a relay race uh, in the sense that um, you can't really hear everything all the time. Um, you know, the composer brings uh, uh, you know an arsenal of sound to the mix, and the sound design team brings an arsenal of sound. And there's dialogue, of course, as well. And the essential thing that happens during the mix of a film is making choices about what's going to be focused on from moment to moment. Mm -hmm. And the, the goal is to make it feel to the audience like they're hearing everything they're supposed to be hearing. Um, but in fact, what they're hearing is this carefully orchestrated shift of focus from this to this to this. And, it, and you know, to get it to feel right uh, requires a lot of work and a lot of experimentation.
Yeah, because otherwise you're just being assaulted constantly with everything, which would be horrifying um, <laughs> and not real, not authentic and, and not immersive. In fact, a lot of people who aren't familiar with sound design um, expect the more sound, the better that the sound is, which is completely wrong. And it, it brings me to a lot of the parts of this film, there's a lot of silences or a lot of ambient sound, especially within the bunker in the Arctic. Um, is there ever a... Like, do you, do you find yourself having to pull back from putting in too much um, flourishes with the sound? How difficult is it to, to design for those very awkward or weird silences? Yeah, the, the silences or near silences are often more difficult to do than noisy, complex uh, sequences that are just stuffed with sounds because uh, they are so subtle and because you do find yourself focusing on just one sound maybe at a time. And so that means that that sound has to be exactly right and feel organic and real, but also do what it needs to do, you know, dramatically in the scene. Um, in, in some of the sequences, for instance, when the astronauts are outside the spaceship and moving around on the outside of the spaceship, uh, sometimes almost the only thing you hear is a very kind of muffled sound of one of them grabbing onto some part of the spaceship to pull themselves along to travel from one place to another. And we spent a lot of time uh, talking about you know with with George and among ourselves about what that should sound like uh, you know if you obey all the laws of physics when you're in a scene like that you really would hear virtually nothing because sound doesn't get transmitted in in the vacuum of space but uh, we decided that uh, our the conceit we would would go for is that what the astronauts are hearing and what we're hearing and we're usually very much in their pov is the sound that gets transmitted from their hands as they grab something up through their bones and uh, directly into their ears without going through any air because there's no air there and so that's why we treated that sound the way we did to to muffle it uh, and often it, it's pretty subtle uh, and, and I think in the end it it worked well. It did, it feels like you're there. Um, I, I'm always conscious of how sound, sound designers are going to um, create, recreate sound in space. Some of them just go all out and forget about the laws of physics. Some of them go the other extreme, perhaps like a movie like Gravity. I think you have a really great balance here and that muffled sound is so, it's even slightly claustrophobic, which is so weird given that you're in the unlimited bounds of space. So yeah, I found that really effective. There's another thing that I found super effective I wanted to raise with you, a specific example where the sound is really quite um, confronting is when the, the scene where Augustine and Iris are, are in that blizzard and there's that wolf in the, in the blurry distance, he shoots his rifle and then the, the shot um, expands to the lands, landscape and that sound ricochets over the landscape. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. We'll talk us through designing the sound for that scene. Yeah, when they uh, discover the crashed airplane. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, uh, it was very important to George that all of that sound absolutely organic and you know, naturalistic and, and real. And we, um, I, I had um, happened to have a lot of recordings of gunshots that I had made um, in uh, canyon areas in the in the Southwest, and in in those recordings, you hear the sound bouncing off of you know cliff walls and mountains and distant trees, et cetera. And the sound just goes on and on and on like a huge clap of thunder will reverberate sometimes for several seconds. And uh, I had a hunch that that's the kind of sound that would be most useful there. Uh, and it has, because it has to linger for a while so that you hear it over the the wolves running away from from the crashed uh, airplane, and so that's the the transitional sound that gets us into that scene. 
And then there was an interesting dance in that sequence between sound design and music. Um, in the beginning, uh, you're hearing mostly sound design <clears throat> and their footsteps and the ice and the wind and various things um, that have been partially ripped off the airplane, kind of flapping in the wind. And then uh, as Augustine goes inside the plane and starts exploring in there, we pull back gradually on all of those kinds of sounds and we let the score take the lead. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, once again, we, you, you know, you try to do it as gracefully as possible so that it doesn't occur to anybody. Why am I not hearing the sound effects yeah. anymore? Um, but I, I think the, it worked well that way. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look back at your career very briefly. Um, you've got a staggering 15 Oscar nominations, um, two wins for the, <clears throat> the right stuff back in 1984 and sound effects editing for The Incredibles in 2004. Um, without sounding like silly, does that ever get old? Like 15 nominations, you don't see a lot of people who have that under their belt. I mean, how does that feel to be constantly recognized by your peers as you know a preeminent sound designer? It's always a thrill. Uh, you know, it's different from the first time, obviously. Um, the first time you get nominated for an Oscar, or the first time you win an Oscar, it's so overwhelming. You, you feel you're in a trance. You don't really understand what's going on. Uh, you just have this big smile on your face all the time and don't know what to say. And so, uh, you know, after it's happened a few times, you're, you're able to be a little more objective about it and and in the moment and conscious of what's going on. But I'd, I'd say the, the thrill never diminishes. And it's, you know, it, as everybody says, it's, it's the, probably the greatest honor is just to be nominated by your peers because the nominations come from within your own category, your own branch of the academy. Um, but it's also a different kind of thrill to be recognized by the academy as a whole from people working in other crafts who see the value in, in what you've done. Um, and you know, this year there are lots of uh, you know, fantastic uh, tracks uh, who are you know, the likely contenders. And uh, you know, I've enjoyed listening to every one of them. Yeah. there's. There is so much to choose from in, in this year. It's been it's been quite competitive, I, I suppose. That brings me to this. Where do you stand on the decision to combine the sound mixing and sound editing categories at the Oscars? Did is that did that annoy you? Did you support it? Um, I, I've been ambivalent about it, uh, as there's been talk about it for the last several years. Um, as you may know, uh, back before the 1980s or before the 1970s. Um, only sound mixers received the, the sound award. And that was grossly unfair because uh, the sound editors or what we now call sound designers uh, were making you know, enormous creative contributions to those tracks. And so in the, the 80s, when the sound editors began also being eligible for the sound award, and the two separate awards were created, uh, it was a great recognition to the work of the sound editors. And so I think a lot of the sound editors were uh, afraid that in some ways this was like going back to the bad old days when, when only the mixers got the awards. But uh, as we know now, the, the same people who have been receiving or eligible for the awards in recent years will still be eligible. It's just that it'll only be one award and instead of uh, sound mixing and sound editing separate. Um, but the other side is that most of the people in the academy found it very difficult to understand what the difference between sound mixing and sound editing are. Mm -hmm. And I understand that completely. Uh, in fact, the differences have become fewer uh, over the last decade or two because of the changes in technology. Often we're using a lot of the same technology to do sound editing and, and sound mixing. Uh, yeah, I sometimes compare it to uh, you know, the production designer 
and the director of photography. The production designer is analogous in some ways to the sound editor in the sense that uh, it's the production designer's job to gather together lots of potential things for the uh, camera to look at. And then it's up to the director and, and the cinematographer to decide which of those will actually be in the frame and which ones will be focused on, etc. cetera. Um, and likewise, the, the sound editor's job is to bring together all these potential sounds that, that may be useful in a given sequence. And then what happens in the mix is that those same kinds of decisions are made, you know, which of those sounds will actually be heard, mm -hmm. how will they be filtered, just as the visual images are, are filtered to some degree by the DP. So I, I think that's a useful analogy for some people who understand the difference, but the differences are subtle and, and the question often arose, well, you know, what's the difference between sound mixing and sound editing? How do I decide, you know, which films have better sound editing and others better mixing? So I think in that sense, uh, one award is is a good thing. Yeah, it's le it means less Oscars for um, people like yourself. But I get I get the collaborative nature of those two art forms, and so I suppose we can live with it if if need be. Randy, thanks so much for your time today. Congratulations on great work on the Midnight Sky, and of course over decades in in motion pictures. And I look forward to speaking to you again sometime soon. Great to speak with you. Bye bye.